Place called White Cone, Arizona. I still have a mother and a father, brothers and sisters, and big family. Good to be here. All you good, kind relatives. Each one of you. I'm just uh, finally got snow over here. A little bit of snow. We're grateful and thankful for that. And I'm grateful and thankful to be here at the new college. And as, as um, Sarah had mentioned, I worked for the Nick College for seven years at one point in time when Dean Jackson, the late Dean Jackson, was still living. And he was the president here of this college. And at that time, they were going through an accreditation, a self-study accreditation. And my purpose was to help all the community campus sites, Ganado, Winderop, Chinle, Tuba City were the sites then. To get into that level where the accreditation team would accredit those centers. So I was very very helpful. I was very grateful to help my, my brother at that time to do that. And now they're all full running capacity. Uh, they're still they're still going. And some of the people that we hired back then are still working for Dinek College too. So good to be back here and good to be back in this Dinek Hatak Net Hatali Center. Your sacred Indian paraphernalia, your Navajo paraphernalia, I'm going to acknowledge that here. Because back then, at that time, the ceremonial dedication of that is so profound and so beautiful and so fundamentally important to this college. Don't ever lose sight of that. And then the, the retie of it that happened recently in December, I was here at the retie that they had that on the 40th anniversary. 50th anniversary of the Net College, right? Coming up? Man, what of a significant accomplishment in Indian country. You, this college is stimulated. Now 40 tribally controlled colleges going towards 44 now. I was just in D.C. Uh, last week and AHEC was meeting. A -A the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. All these colleges from throughout the country and I really felt proud of the Net College that we look at what, what we have brought in an education up to this point in time. So I thank you, the faculty, staff, the, your new president that you have, the board, and all the uh, students here. And I was really grateful and thankful to, to know that there was a psychology BA program that started here. Man, that's something real nice and beautiful and good. And that's what I came here to support that, to tell you that we're behind you. So I'm going to share a little, a little perspective of my journey in this discipline of psychology. Earlier, I, I had engaged the students about some of the disciplines, some of the schools of thought in psychology. So I titled this... Um, presentation I'm going to make. There's a number of presentations I've been making um, throughout this great country of ours. And this one here is Warrior Spirit. Warrior Spirit. A natural force in mental health treatment modalities. And this Warrior Spirit concept, the Warrior Spirit concept has really was... Um, I was informed of this warrior spirit concept in treatment working with Vietnam, vet, Vietnam veterans in the regional hospital in Salt Lake City. Uh, that was my clientele, a PTSD clinic, post-traumatic stress, stress disorder clinic. And that's where this began to come into my mind about this warrior spirit, something that we already knew, something we know already, us Indian people. And not only Indian people, but other nationalities. And that's why I, I titled this Administers to the Spirit. 
to the spirit of a human being. That's really the essence of psychology, to administer that treatment to their spirit, not to their mind, to their spirit that interacts with their mind. So I founded this company, Native Holistic Specialists Incorporated. Native Holistics, you're a specialist, all of you, right here. You're a specialist and you, you already, that warrior spirit's already innate in you. That healing spirit's already innate in you, inside you. So I, I, somebody told me one English teacher, so you spell holistic wrong. Where's the English teacher here? Somewhere. <laughs> you spell holistic wrong. I say, yeah, if you think about it, the way you're thinking about it in, in terms of the holy order, yes. But that's included in there, holistic, because there's a spiritual element in the holistic modality of treatment, treating the whole person, mind, body, soul, and spirit. So that's a little bit about us. I was telling them, the students earlier, what mode they asked one, one question was, what motivated me? After I, um, after I worked for the Nick College for seven years, I left here and I went to Windrock School District to work in a, as a mental health person, as a school counselor there. Walked in my office, got hired, walked in my office and said, you need to go right now, get in this school vehicle, go over there to location A. There's a person over there trying to end their life. A young student here, a seventh grade student here. We need your intervention right now, today, go over there. So I went over there. I went to that person, that location, that home. And yes, there was a young man there. Ready, had a rope upon a tree around his neck. He was tired of living. He was tired of all the stuff going on in and around him. So made the intervention that we did, brought him down, got him, looked for help for him. That's when I found out that there was no Navajo psychologist, no Indian psychologist. There was no community-based types of interventions that this family could reach out to in our community of Windorog, Fort Defiance, St. Michael. Then I began looking out throughout the Navajo Nation. There's nothing at that time, 1980, 88, 89, and this was happening. So that, that was one of my motivators to go back to school. There was an opportunity to go back to school and pursue a PhD in psychology, clinical or counseling psychology. So that's what I did, finished my program, explained to the students what that takes, the type of commitment it takes. So when I came back from there, from the University of Utah, um, founded, founded this company, Native Holistic Specialist Inc., 1998. And this fine young man, this psychologist right here, we went, to, we, we interned, we postdoc at the same facility, him and I. He's working at Chin Lee. Can you stand up, sir? Yeah, this, this doctor here. We made that connection. Now he's at Chin Lee. We work under the same neuropsychologist that I referenced earlier. But how this company started was I, we had all these white, I'm not I'm meaning in a derogatory term, all these white psychologists and psychiatrists at the VA and we had these Indian patients coming. They didn't know how to treat them. Where the Northern Plains people coming in to that facility. One Navajo person came in. They would always send me over there to work with the Indians. And when I started working with the Indians, ha, you can't do that. That's not the way we do things. That's against these guidelines and protocol. But this is an Indian patient. This is an Indian person from a reservation. They understand this treatment. So part of this company was founded to bring these traditional medicine people from throughout the United States up into Canada and Alaska and to bring these Indian or these 
Western trained psychologists to come together to talk about healing. So that was the birth of this Native Holistic Specialist Inc. And these are the types of services we do. As Sarah had mentioned, statistics and research. That's what I want to push on these students, statistics and research. Because statistics and research that drives psychology, any psychology, it's the engine that drives it. The diagnostics tools, the data, the psychological evaluation, how you make sense of that. And in my dissertation, my, di my dissertation was on Navajo adolescent depression and cultural identity. Because when you read in the scholarly literature, our young people between age 13 and 19 are the most depressed under that diagnosis. So, didn't really believe it. So I had to investigate, and I'll, I'll uh, share that a little bit with you. But out of, out of all that, this Warrior Spirit Indigenous Psychology Conference came in to blend Western and Indigenous Psychology. The first one we had was in 2002, 2004, 6, 8, 10, 12, 16. The Nick College started partnering with me on that. How many of you have attended that, this conference? It's a good conference. It's all funded by this right here. My own pocket, my own money. Whatever earnings I got, selling coffee at the flea market, <laughs> cleaning yards, selling wood, all that to fund this conference and try to be, why I wanted to do that is because many of these sponsors, they wanted to bring an element in there that I didn't agree with. So to keep it pure indigenous. So these, the last one we had was last November. And it was called Medicine Words. Medicine Words. Think about that. Medicine Words. Like you students, you're reading this literature in psychology. Medicine Words. Those of you that are parents, you tell your children, I love you, son, daughter, I love you. Do good, do medicine words. The song that my brother sang, the prayer, medicine words. The research that we did, medicine words. So we captured it like that. And we had a decent turnout, but I think that you know we're gonna put another part two to that. Coming up, not this year, but the, ne the next year. So just a little bit about that. Um, some of our founding principles. And here, what I begin to understand, indigenous psychology. Last fall, I went to UNM. I went to the UNM Counseling Psychology Department. They said, hey, Dr. White, come over. We need you to look at and read something where we have. And it was real interesting to me when I went over there. There was a research scholarly work said indigenous psychology in America. The publisher was University of Korea. <laughs> there was some four Korean researchers that came out to the United States went to Indian communities, maybe came to the Nick College, maybe came to Tsai Lee, maybe herd sheep for you, chop wood for you. And they wrote a paper on indigenous psychology of the American Indian. What do you think of that? I said, man, this is crazy. What did they know about indigenous thinking, indigenous language? They don't know. I said, we, we certainly disagree with this. So that was a real eye opener. And then when I was doing my research, got really curious about the presentation I was gonna make on mental health. Ran across this, raise your hand if you heard of the asylum, insane asylum for American Indians. You ever hear that? 
1898, Asylum for Insane Indians. 1898, Canton, South Dakota. What in the heck are these? What were they doing? So I looked at it, their roster. Who was in, in the patients in there? Then I ran across patient number 21, Chi. Chi from Chinle, Arizona. Canyon de Shea, Chi, he said. How did they get him in that facility? That's something that the U.S. government will not tell you about that. That's kind of under, under, I guess, not to be shared with the public. But then they closed that asylum in 1928. But just think of all those Indians, and there was all kind of inner tribal people in that asylum. Who did the diagnosis? Who was the psychiatrist? Like, what did they do to these Indians? I thought. So that, this kind of that's just uh, like they say a, a off off the side comment on what I'm talking about. But here, what I begin to find out and understand about indigenous psychology, there was a person that asked me, asked me how is that different from Western psychology. Well, one of the fundamental differences is symbolism. Indigenous people use symbols for wellness. Indigenous people use symbols to communicate. Look at, go down the street, like when I was coming from Window Rock up this way, all this graffiti on these stores, on these tanks, on these abandoned homes, even on the Diné College sign. Symbolism. They're community, we're community, still communicating in symbolism. But in this here, this, in, this is an indigenous psychology, symbolism, diagnostic symbol that I begin to incorporate, to blend in with my Western psychology diagnostic paradigm. So in here, this says a lot, if you really begin to observe it. First, in the middle, there's a fire. There's a traditional story about our fire. There's a ethic about that fire. There's a female, a male fire. A home in a fire. There's a, a home always has a fire in there. There's a how we raise our children around that fire. So there's already a diagnostic in there. And then you have these footprints, like a chain around that, let's say fireplace, home place, community, that, that path of this person that walked around it. In that diagnostic right there, you have these four cardinal directions. What we say would be, Spring, summer, fall, winter. Okay. Early morning, afternoon, evening, night. Okay. Mom, Dad, Che, Nelly. Okay. Where did it happen? Where did this trauma happen in that? There. Then on this outer part of it, these circles, like that's that air we were talking about, administer to the spirit. When you administer to a person in psychology, the way my mentor had to, these old European people, when they started doing psychology, they administered to the spirit. But to legitimatize them as a worthy discipline, they had to take that spirit out and put that science in there. That's how he had told me. And he was saying, I'm recruiting you to this PhD program to learn this so that you could administer to the spirit of an individual. So earlier there was a question by one of the curious students, what does that mean, in your administer to the spirit? Good question. That's a good question. And it becomes, in this 
diagnostic that's that human growth spirit, your breath, your breath of life in there, and your emotion, your psychology, your psychology of your emotion. So this represents that in terms of a symbolism. Then you have these eagle feathers out there. Now, one of the one of the aspects that I begin to understand in my work, and this is at the VA and then into our research. How is somebody well? I had a class, psychopathology, what they call how do you diagnose mental illness? These doctors, they know. They know that how you diagnose mental illness. You're a mentally ill person. You, right there. Because these say you're mentally, these psychological tests say you you're, have mental illness. So the whole purpose of that class was to study that. How do we diagnose somebody's mental illness? Oh, it's a big class like this right here. A lot of smart students. And I was sitting in there among all of them. I said, hey, Mr. Professor, I'm over here. Can you see me? Yes, I can see you. Do you have a question? Yes, I have a real fundamental question. Help me understand when you say you're mentally healthy. How do you say you're mentally healthy? We're learning about how to say you're mentally ill. When I go to the doctor, they take my blood pressure, my heart rate, all that, and they say, okay, Calvin, you're physically healthy. How about on this side, in mental? Is there such a thing? How come you're focusing on illness? As, a, as me, as a Navajo person, as an as a Indian person, it's hard for me to think that way. Because we always think, I guess, Mr. Professor, I'll put it this way. Patient, you're three feet from achieving mental health. That's how I would put it in the Indian term. He responded, that's a good question. I was never asked that. Well, an Indian never took your class, right? Res born Indian, right here. This guy, right here. A foreign thinker, but yet an indigenous person to this land. So in that, these diagnostic quadrants here, these eagle feathers, that's what they represent, your mental health. Okay. Now, this warrior spirit, warrior spirit that, we, that I label this, that's that inside you. I guess um, how you would say it's innate, you're born with it. You're born to survive. You're not born, once you're born, you're born into this world, you come out, mom born, born you, you're born to survive. You're born to live. So everything around your life is that, to live to move forward, to live, to have a healthy life. You're not born to be sick. You're not born, you're born with that human growth spirit. That's that warrior spirit, that natural part of you to live. How many of you got your flu shot? Huh? That's that warrior spirit you want to live. <laughs> so you went to the doctor and said, go ahead and poke me. Even though it's cobra venom, I want to get sick to live. That's that warrior spirit in you that did that. Or how many of you, well, we'll leave it that right there. So the, pur um, the purpose I'm here to share this men indigenous perspective of, of mental health and healing, not mental illness and diagnostic, not that. That's a part of it, yes. And then also I'll, to honor our American Indian therapists and other therapists that work with our people. I just clinical psychologist from Chin Lee to work in a clinical setting. It's hard. 
it's hard to do that kind of work. Why is it hard? Because people don't want to give up their bad habits. They want to, I'll put it this way, like a lot of patients, clients that I see here that I work with don't know how to be well. It's kind of sad to say. They rather live in chaos, in dysfunction, because that's what they use, they're used to doing that. Send them off to a treatment center, go through all that treatment, and what did they do? They come back and get back involved in the things that they weren't supposed to do that they told was called cause them all kind of illness. To identify these indigenous treatment modalities, to create Knowledge on indigenous psychology. That's where I think right here, this campus. Man, you have a grand opportunity, faculty and staff and students, to add to this body of knowledge of indigenous psychology. To build this theory. To build this theory of healing and wellness. To write about it in a scholarly way. Like this, one of the things that I developed was this Navajo culture identity measure using my love for statistics and numbers and how that cultural identity impacts wellness. And the parameters of what our elders say are, cult are elements of cultural identity other than clanship knowing your clan. Beyond that, what is it? Really, I guess the question comes, who are you as an individual? Where are you coming from? What kind of character do you have? What is your potential? What is your, you might, you might say, your, your reference? What is your reference, your control mechanism? your boundaries, that right there. And then to honor our culture, language, and history, to honor the warrior spirit. Earlier question by one of our guests earlier, how does this indigenous psychology differ from Western psychology? Good question again. And it, it, this tells me these students are thinking, these staff are thinking. When I begin to write, my dissertation on identity. Identity. You have different psychologists that wrote about identity. Like you have the white ethnic identity model by one of the founders is Dr. Finney about how white people create an identity for themselves here, you have the black identity model. You have the Hispanic identity model. So when I begin to read all these information, those are all people that were forced to be here, like the black people, Hispanic people. The, the white people came here. How about us? We were already here. So those don't fit with what, how we identify ourselves. What's our pillars of our identity model? What is it? And I come to understand it's our language, our language and our culture that's tied to this land. That's your ethnic identity. And when I went throughout Indian country, it's the same. It's their culture, their language and history tied to the land. That creates an identity. And it seems like up to this point in time, that's the number one factor with a lot of our social ills and psychology issues is a lack of identity. Follow me? Okay. So like you have people that are breaking in houses People stealing cattle, horses. That's a lack of identity in my, from this perspective, because 
They didn't identify with the land or the community or the type of lifestyle. They, they moved somewhere they, that, that's foreign to them. This is one of my heroes, I'll tell you that, Geronimo, one of my heroes. He, he took off the res from a reservation. He wanted to be, he didn't want to be under res. He wanted to enjoy his land. He's, he took off with some warriors. He's one of my heroes. Now, but I, I'll, what is his psychology? What is, is his indigenous psychology? Like, right now, the Navajo Nation, this is, to me, it's a two-sided issue. The celebration of the Treaty of 1868, is it a celebration? Okay. Is it a commemoration? You know what? We're all impacted by the Treaty of 1868. All of us, right here, look at yourself. Take time. Have you, did you look at yourself in the mirror lately? Before I came up, I looked at myself in the mirror. And I said, 1868 treaty impacted me. Look at how I am. Because the original treaty is supposed to come to Navajo. The first words in that treaty are to assimilate and acculturate the Navajo people. So look at, are we assimilated? If, if I were say, to say, okay, zero assimilation, 10, fully assimilated, where are you? On that fully assimilated, 10. Five. Yeah, five, 10, three, two. So the, call, the treaty accomplished something. It assimilated us. All right. Now, that assimilation, how, has, how have you used that to help yourself? That's the question I have. So in that, there, you could say there were some benefits and rewards to that. So when you think about that, that piece of it, like me, I got a PhD. So does that mean I'm fully assimilated? No. Okay. So, I've been challenges our tribal leaders not put all, all impose this on the next students too, the next college faculty, the next faculty here. What happened before 1868, 1867 back? I've never seen any published research on that piece. What kind of psychology did we have back then? What kind of lifestyle did we have? Look at Geronimo, man. No fat on him. He probably is not even diabetic. He probably doesn't have heart disease. No domestic violence. Even though he has a rifle, that's for other purposes. <laughs> the first published research on Navajo was in 1872, 1870, the first published article on the Navajo people. And the article was related to what kind of arrows were we using? Because our warriors that were so powerful and good marksmen that they could kill a cavalry soldier with one arrow. So they were interested, are we putting poison on that arrow? What made it so accurate? That was the first published research back in 1872. So when we look at this, blend some of these, this warrior spirit and cultural identity. Like the cultural identity piece. These, these are fundamental, I'll say fundamental American Indian concepts but are worded in different ways. This warrior spirit concept, the warrior spirit concept comes from Nayek'e teachings. Nayek'e. 
this protection way ceremonial teachings here. It comes from that, that warrior spirit. This cultural identity piece comes from that blended with this beauty way. So in that, you're a native holistic specialist because you're not all warrior. And then you're not all you're blended together. You're one, you're a holistic person. These two interact with one another to create this cultural identity. So some of my colleagues in psychology, right now the trend, historical trauma, that's the trend now, moving that way. Maria Braveheart, a Lakota woman, professor at the University of New Mexico, published on that. I respectfully disagree with you because over here, the cultural identity piece is what made our warriors. We weren't so traumatized like when our warriors went out to battle to fight for our families and our land. They didn't come back traumatized. They did it with a purpose. But it seems like right now we're out of balance with that. We're out of balance in creating that identity. To blend these two modalities together. So what does that mean? What does this warrior spirit mean? Well, it means the physical, spiritual, mental, spiritual, physical, mental, psychological, and psychological preparation as the warrior has to engage for battle. Okay, looking, looking over there, okay, let's talk about that. When our people, when they went into battle, they didn't just go to kill just for the sake of killing. There was a preparation there was a, to protect family, community, and land, to protect our way of life. There was a sense of purpose in engaging the, ba the battle. They didn't battle for unknown reasons. They didn't go, they go into battle with pride, pride, honor, and dignity, you might say, to sacrifice themselves. Okay? And create, is creating an environment where there is, there is a sense of belonging established. There is a value given to these roles and responsibilities. That's the way we were. I guess you could say prior 1868. That was our modality with this warrior spirit. Men and women, not just only men. So in that, you know, Looking at this right here, like coming from your bloodline, your family history, who you are as an individual person, like in your clanship, we can all say our clans, and, but behind that clan, what is your character? What is the character that you possess? What is the talent? Who mentors that? Who mentors you with that? Given all this right here, like with our children, given all that, what kind of people would we be with this type of introduction? Now, let's pick on the Treaty of 1868 a little bit now. In that, you know, to acculturate and to assimilate us was to take out this part of our natural type of teaching to our children and our grandchildren and to create, replace it with Western education to create that there, in there. And then from 1868 this way, what happened to us up to this point in time? So thinking along those lines, kind of career, maybe kind of making some of you feel uncomfortable, which is good. I came here to make you feel uncomfortable. And I came here to make you think as well. So I did, in these, back in those days, you know, these warriors were selected, and these like were their traditional 
types of teachings and outcomes, male and female. This is a little bit of philosophy. So in this composition here, this mission to protect, preserve, and sustain Indian ways of living, the well-being of people, courage, honor, value, standards, and ethics. To have all that. When I engage my young people in my clinical work, I find all those missing in their, their presentation of their challenge. The number one thing that I find missing is their values and standards and ethics. Like they don't value they don't value their family. They don't value their community. They don't value school. There's no standards and ethics that they live by. It's kind of fragmented, ambiguous. Like they're lost, wandering out there in our communities. So it seems like as, as a treatment paradigm, how do we teach that back? to our children and our grandchildren in this. So, spirituality, mental health, physical, and psychological. Now, this is, this is one of the real sensitive things here, spirituality. When we, anytime we talk about spirituality, religion, it could include religion but then it could not include religion, where people get defensive of that. And I don't mean to offend anybody by this, but what I'm talking about in the, in the spirituality piece of this indigenous psychology is that administration to your spirit, to your human growth spirit. And the way that the indigenous medicine people, philosophers was like aligning with a guardian animal or bird spirits using Indian paint feathers and regalia. Okay. Creating that position to battle and having this sacrifice piece of it. Sweating, protection waste ceremonies, fasting, physically having exercise, diet, mobility, and being the relentless warrior ego state. So, my point to bring this out here, to bring it to your awareness, is that those are all part of us already, our young people. It's already innate in them. Yet they're, it seems like they're going across to a foreign piece here that is not aligned with these pillars in indigenous psychology, in the warrior spirit, such as causing, as psychologists say, clinical, a psychic conflict of their identity. Oh, these are this a little bit more on that. Now, I'm going to kind of speed through a little bit here and get to some slides. Um, let me back up here. And this pillar here, and this slide here, what I wanted to share with you is the family, people, community, land, and prote protecting against intruders in this right here. Now, what we are beginning to conceptualize now, it's not foreigners invading us in human form. It's not that. It's all these social problems, alcohol, drugs, sexual abuse. Sexual abuse is so prevalent. Gets me sick. When I first came back from Utah, when I started seeing my clients, young adolescents, it's always sexual abuse by a family member, never fail. 
got to the point where it made me sick to my stomach because of the abuse these children went through. And they're out there. They're in our schools. They're having a hard time. They're running away from home. All that. That's what I see right here, firsthand. So, looking at that, how do we protect our children from that? How do we engage that? that that's, a, that's a tough one right there to get, get them out of that. But that's why I said, why are we protecting? What, who are they protecting and against what? So when we look at psychology piece of it, and we, when we look at the indigenous psychology piece of it, this piece right here, how do we bring that in? So I think, you know, this as I was sharing with our students earlier, the different pathways, career pathways, in schools of thought with psychology, as well as treatment, as well as disciplines of psychology. I think all that, we need to combine that together. And being a Navajo psychologist at this point, I need help. We need help. We am rallying out to all you young people. You found we need help. Our psychiatrist, psychologist, he knows it. And it's just not really coming together as much and as fast as we need. One of my other heroes, Crazy Horse. Crazy Horse never had his photo taken. He fought to the death. It's just like some of us clinical psychologists, that's the way I look at it too. We fight to the death of all these social ills. It takes a toll. Yes, it does. But, you know, that's the warrior spirit in us. So I conceptualize like this, warrior being the therapist, the spirit being the, men, the therapeutic alliance. How you work with your client. The natural force, your natural force moving towards, that's your human growth spirit, moving towards wellness. Your mental health, not your mental illness, your mental health well-being and identity, your mental health. Tomorrow morning, when you get up, I want you to tell somebody, I wish you mental health. I can see your mental health in you. That's going to sound strange. They're going to say, what the hell are you talking about? Instead of saying, you're no good for nothing, you can't think, you're, you, you're losing, you're, Useless and you're lazy. Seems like that's what we hear. Seems that we hear that. Whenever I say you're a mentally healthy person, I can see your mental health. Oh, that was an evidence of your mental health. Then the treatment here is the interventions and strategies. All this right here in this conceptualization of the warrior spirit. So let's move on here. To, I, um, how much time? Four minutes? Okay. Let me move up here. I got, okay, like I said, I can talk about this and pray about this all night, all day, all night, all day again. This is the science. I'm going to show you the science of indigenous psychology. This is the Navajo cultural identity measure that I developed for 300, 300, now, no, a thousand Navajo students, but narrowed it down to 300 valid scores. Now, in here, it's talking about all these pillars, family knowledge, environmental knowledge, spiritual knowledge, family attitude, environmental, spiritual attitude. These are the number of items. This is the mean score. Here. So when I look at that, 
This is the standard deviation of each of those scores. And then this is what they call chrome box alpha. You have that the minimum cut to be reliable is 0.83. Look at this res boy. He made it all the way 0.82. Now what this is saying, this, look, let's look at this family knowledge scale. Basic fundamental Navajo. What's your clan? What's your dad, your chi, your nullies clan? That's what it is, items like that. 26 items. So out of that 26 items, score of 13, half. So what's that telling you about our basic clan knowledge of our young people, 13 to 19? What's it telling you? They don't know. They don't know it. These are 13, 19 year olds from Wonder Rock High School, Ganado, Shinli, Tuba City, Kienta. Okay. This environmental knowledge, the environmental knowledge was Sisna Jin, So Zi, Doko Sli, the Bensa, the Thong, Cho Yi. Where are they located? Look at that. 18. The number of items, their average score was five. Now, think about it, 13 to 19. So these scales here, I went to the Navajo Medicine Man's Association. Give me a fundamental identity of Navajo people. They talked about that, yeah. family knowledge, environmental knowledge. That's the number one. So when we look at this piece here, what's it telling us as a people? What it's saying is that our students at high school, they don't know. There's another study that we did of how this interacts with depression. I'll show that to you in a little bit. This is an MMPI, this is a depression scale a personality scale, MMPIA, right here. There's a content and a clinical scale. Then there's a children's depression inventory, dsm 4 questionnaire D. There's a number of items here. This is the mean here. This is the standard deviation again. So what I found out in this analysis is that now our young people aren't as depressed as people are saying. That's the fundamental piece. We're not as depressed. Nobody's done a normative scale on depression for Navajo people, Navajo adolescents. So when they say this adolescent is depressed, you better check the validity of your diagnostic because it's not saying, it's not coming out the way you're saying it. And then I'm going to finish up on this model. There's about 50 more slides, and I don't want to keep you here all night. <laughs> this is what we call a full-scale structural model, structural equation modeling, structural equation hierarchical linear modeling, fancy terms. So go back to your husband tonight your boyfriend, your girlfriend. Did you really go to the lecture? <laughs> yes. Well, what'd you learn? Structural equation modeling. <laughs> you could say that. A proof you were here. So what this is saying here is this difference that I showed you. And the Navajo cultural identity measure all interact with this depression statistically. That's what it's saying. That's the theory. That's what it's saying. So when we ran the numbers on this here, right here, so each of these little numbers here, they're saying how much these instruments pre predict depression in Navajo adolescents. On this side, the numbers on this side, 
are saying how much they predict the person as well. Okay. Uh, this is really not clear, but the most reliable predictor is attitude. This is a negative 21. Negative 21. So what, what that's saying, negative 21 to depression, what that is telling us statistically is that Navajo students that have a positive cultural identity based on these cultural measures are less likely to be depressed by these instruments. So what is that telling you? What is it telling you? What is it informing you of? Huh? Cultural bias in the instruments. That's one. What else is it saying? It's saying we're not as depressed as we think we are. Number two, number three, is that cultural identity combats depression. So you, all those things that I led up to, to this here, is saying that if we're, as a part of our intervention, cultural identity needs to be in there as a modality to combat these instruments. As far as I know, the Navajo cultural identity measure is the only one in existence up to this point in time. And guess who was that developed by? Who? Hey. <laughs> so this to demonstrate to our students and to the fact this can be done. It can be done in a with scientific rigor. It can be done to establish the pillars of indigenous psychology. So that's what I wanted to share with you here. And tell you the Nick College, your undergraduate psychology program, I commend you for that. Our first cohort of graduate students that's gonna be led by my brother. I applaud you for that. So now if we put this together in a format to help our people, how much more improved will our communities and our families be? That much more, I think. So I'm going to stop right there and see if you have any questions. If not, you have been a very attentive audience. And I look forward to seeing you down the road again. Yes, ma'am. That's lecture two. <laughs> the reason I say that is I did, I developed a whole lecture on, on that for traditional practitioners. And that's, that's a, but there is a way to do that. I'll just leave a comma right there. Thank you. Wait, 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 wait. Yes, ma'am. Are you hiring? Am I hiring? Right now, our budget's in a crisis. <laughs> but well, the real intent that we have with my business is I'm going to establish the Warrior Spirit Healing and Research Institute that's coming. And in our conference that we have, we give scholarships. We give scholarships to masters and PhD level students in psychology. The last one we gave was to a Menominee from Michigan and then to a Shawnee from, that was going to um, school in St. Louis. The Navajos didn't, even they thought we were fooling around. <laughs> oh, it was a $3,000 scholarship each. There was the next college students there. So, yes, we're, 
Well, work, so look out for that. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. There's no, there's no translation. There's no one single word translation. Then, there's a whole story about depression, about how depression came to our people, but it's not depression in Navajo. That's a good question. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Ashia. Let's everybody give Dr. White a round of applause.